Medi-Cal is almost one third of everyone in California. Uh, when you add on Medicare, you get up to almost half of everyone in California. And it's not just insured patients, that's literally half of everyone who lives in the state. The vast majority of office visits in Medicare and Medi-Cal are still done by small practice providers and community health centers. So they are these essential providers, an essential piece of our network, but often overlooked because they're serving the most vulnerable populations um, and the hardest to, to treat populations. That patient population typically requires additional considerations. In particular, now the big discussion is about social determinants of health, and that's really looking at a patient population holistically. What kind of access to food do they have? What kind of access to clinics do they have? Uh, what are their social environment looks like? Uh, who is supporting them uh, on an emotional level? I always think of a story one physician told me of treating a patient for his asthma. Six months, could not get his asthma under control, different medications, inhaler, et cetera, et cetera. It was six months in by the time the physician found out the guy was living under a bridge. Over the last few years, five years, 10 years, we've really gotten good at collecting more information. I think our next steps are really looking and making sure we're collecting good information. It's not just about what medical conditions they have, where have they been seen before, what pharmaceuticals are they on. It's also about things like, do they have a home? You know, do they have access to decent food, places to exercise? You know, these things that some of us may take for granted, but have a huge effect on their health care. Nutrition has been so undervalued in health care for so many years, and that's just crazy to me because it's one of the few um, specialties that moves the needle on things like readmissions prevention, 30-day mortality, it reduces hospital-acquired infections. There are so many reasons that healthcare systems need to elevate the role of nutrition. As I got more into it, I saw that if you didn't treat the behavioral health condition, then the physical condition gets worse. And in fact, people who have, for example, diabetes and they have depression are three times more expensive. You know, there's still a lot that has to happen uh, with uh, operationalizing the information, uh, but I think some of the reluctancy in doing that is that we don't have a lot of answers for what we're going to do after that. That is also uh, going to depend on physician behavior uh, and how uh, in tune they are to, to entering that information, eliciting that information from patients, and then deciding that it is a physician or a healthcare organization or a clinic or whatever's role to then intervene on, say, home marginal housing or food insecurity or uh, social isolation. It might be that the community clinic flags that, hey, this patient not only are we seeing this patient, but they're also sleeping outside on the sidewalk. And how do we get them connected to the right services to get them into a regular source of housing? Before you can standardize, I think that we need to play around a little bit. I think that we need to find some companies and tools and products that are uh, facilitating improved outcomes, improving mortality, uh, reducing uh, risk factors. And once we've done that, then we can actually uh, start to test them. Our technology actually tracks and shows the impacts of those clinical decisions. So whether it's a nurse doing a screening, a physician assessing a patient, we're able to prove in real time what are the impacts on patient outcomes and what is the overall benefit to the health system. In reality, we don't screen for depression or behavioral health conditions as frequently as we should. Um, and on the other side, for the monitoring, there's a problem because the behavioral health providers are it's essentially blind in between clinic visits. Surveys are boring to fill out, they're not necessarily scalable, and so we figured we needed to find a new way to do that that is scalable, that is engaging to people, uh, gives them a little more control of how they, you know, what they say, uh, and that's how we sort of address the gap. I would say the biggest problem in my mind is the competing priorities between different providers. Or, and that includes from the government level, the state government level, which do have two different viewpoints, as well as the hospitals, the providers, the pharmaceutical and life sciences industries. And so when people see a problem and they start to pull out a string and they really want to solve that one problem, you don't really understand how it ties into every other problem and how you're going to really 
fix this one part of the industry without disrupting all of the rest of it. And it's, it's people then have to change the entire system, which becomes a very large endeavor that I'm not sure our country is ready for. So I, I, that, that interplay between trying to fix the small problems and then also looking at the big level picture is really hard.